കരുണാർണവമായ കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം ബുദ്ധി അഹങ്കാരം പുലംബേതവും മദ്ദീതയം താൻ മറയവനും ആലും Namaste Richard. Namaste Adya Shakti. Hey, you're you're improving. <laughs> well, bit by bit we I don't know if we get better but we get less worse. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, what do we got going today? Uh what I wanted to talk about today we already had an introduction to this wonderful work of Murugana's uh going through Ramana's saying and we were introduced nicely to it in the last section but what I wanted to start with was there's a whole long section that is really about practice and uh what i have always felt is that it is in actual practice that uh you get a chance to experience these things and turn them into your internal knowledge and so uh the teaching about theory if you will is great in that it provides a context but uh it doesn't count or mean anything until it becomes your experience and i i think you're the only person i know who understands the relation between context and content okay and how context creates meaning and makes the content come alive yes yes and certainly uh i've gotten uh that in listening to you and even before i listened to you i would still try to set the context i was not as clear on the language of describing it but i would do it anyway cuz you have to really you know you have to otherwise it's just a bunch of disconnected ideas and i already have enough disconnected ideas so <laughs> i don't need to be sending more of them out into the universe okay you look well illuminated <laughs> from within and without that's right that's right i just expect you to sit there and glow and white out the video boom <laughs> <laughs> So that would be a good explosion. You can add that in post too. That's right. <laughs> okay, maybe that's how Jesus did it with all those halos, you know. In post. <laughs> well, with him it took about 1600 years to get to the enlightenment uh, painters. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> But anyway, Okay, Guru Vachika Kovai is a uh, really an indispensable resource for anyone who wants to go deep into Ramana's teaching. Cuz like you say, it gives not only the theory but also the practice. Yes. And I don't know why we need all of this help with all of the words from uh the teachers to help us along the way uh what i have felt like personally is it must be because this mind is really so slow at absorbing these things and you know i'm uh immensely grateful for uh the work these teachers have done to be able to express this Muruganar Sadhu Om Yes teachers I like know me Yes they have given a really nice commentary Yes we need to hear again and again repetition 
Yes, yes. For me, uh, I think to be able to actually hear what Nomi had to say, and by hear, I'm not talking about with my ears. I'm talking about you could say it one way with my heart, to say it poetically, uh, I think took 15 years. That sounds about right. <laughs> so... Anyway. Because we have so much vasanas yes. piled up yes. from many, many previous lives. It's going to take a, a little while to cut through all that. Right. Now, one of the things that I've loved, though, about Ramana's teaching is, you know, I knew from my earlier days uh, studying Chan Buddhism that the problem were all of these ideas and concepts and things like this. And the practices that I had learned from that side gave me the idea that all I had to do to get free was to uh, clean up each one of these bad ideas. And the bad ideas I have seem to be infinite. And so That's I. That's the problem. And I never knew how, if I was going to get to the bottom of the stack. And then when I understood Ramana's teachings, then. I understood I only had to get rid of one bad idea, and that is the idea that I'm this individual. That's the root. You cut mm -hmm. the root, and the whole plant dries up. Yes. And uh, it seems like uh, getting rid of one bad idea is easier than cleaning up an infinite stack of them. Indeed. So let's see if we can get rid of some more bad ideas. <laughs> I'm all for it. With the help of the generous help of Murugana and Ramana. And we start with a verse about the greatness of instruction. The uninterrupted shining of the self, the life of life, as the natural consciousness, I, I, in the heart, is the nature of God's giving unbroken apodatia to the worthy disciple. And Marukhanar has comment, or Sadhu Om has comments here. This verse explains further the idea revealed in the instruction, quote, for a few highly mature souls, it so happens that the Lord reveals the reality from within by his being the knowledge of their knowledge, end quote. This was given as a reply to the eighth question, how is it that some great ones attain the supreme knowledge without, even without a guru? In this chapter, Upadesha, in the book Upadesha Manjari, given by Sri Bhagavan, and Muruganar goes on to say, or Sadhu Om goes on to say, this verse explains how self, being the guru within, teaches the tr true knowledge to a fully mature soul, even without taking a human form outside. The shining of I, I, the essence of the consciousness, am, is the silent teaching of the inner guru, self. Since the supreme non-dual knowledge is nothing but the self-consciousness I am, its shining as I, I, itself, is the silent inner advice. Wow, that's nectar. <laughs> wow. I think for the audience, though, we need to explain I, I. Yes. 
that's a little bit uh, difficult to understand. Yes. So go ahead and tell us about I <laughs> I. I was kind of asking a question, but that's okay. <laughs> because we talked about in the state of Turiya, the object of consciousness is consciousness itself. Yes. So since consciousness is not separate from the self with a capital S, that means it's the self being aware of itself. In other words, there is no separate object. Yes. There is no objective reality in that state or yes. at all, really. <laughs> and so uh, Ramana came up with this term, I, I, to describe this state where self is aware of itself. Yes. Both as being and awareness. And both of those are absolute. Yes. Without boundaries. Yes. Without individuality. Yes. Without desires. And all that goes along with that, such as space, time, dimension, activity, and so on and so forth. The world and others. Yes. And I uh, appreciate your view there. One of the things that I found in the beginning of reading Ramana is he used this term I, I, and in other places he used I thought in terms like this, and it was real clear that he's talking about the I that knows itself as opposed to the I that knows some other thing. And mm. uh, this is another case where if you really understood just what that meant, I think that's enough. It is, indeed. The problem is, of course, we have this habit of objective consciousness. Yes. Where the consciousness is directed toward the senses and the mind. Yes. And thinking that those things are real. Yes. So before we can become conscious of self as I, I, then we have to let go of those other things. Yes. Even for a moment. You know, it doesn't have to be like a permanent state in the beginning. Right. But it could be just a glimpse. Like, uh, how can I give an example? The, the moon is rising and we're riding in a car through a forest. But every once in a while, there's a break in the trees and we get to see the moon clearly. Otherwise, we only see it. Yeah, we only see it obscured by the branches. Yes. And these glimpses in the early stages of practice are the thing that really, for me, continued to motivate me. Those glimpses somehow just fills me even if it's only a glimpse. And uh, the, that is one of the things that really encourage, encourages practice. Yes, because you have a vision of the goal. It's not just a vision of the goal. You have an experience of the goal. Well, which yeah, is, it is the goal. <laughs> is what uh, matters. But to the neophyte who is struggling with the mind and so on it's a reassurance that this is attainable yes yes and and this is already existing within me yes i don't have to go out somewhere and get it from somewhere else yes again that was one of the things i thought that was wonderful about the teaching when i really first started to understand it is that uh they would say it's not a matter of transformation 
It's a matter of noticing what is already there. You know, how can you ever become something you're not? That's the problem with transformation. Is right. It uh, sets up some issue that is impossible to begin with. And all we're well, going to... can you... <laughs> How can you become something you already are? Well, I don't know. I think that's trouble. <laughs> stumbled. Uh, people have stumbled on that for a while. And I like the way he describes this as a silent self-knowledge. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yeah, because there's no verbal content in it at all. But simply the silent knowing I am. Yes. And again, my own experience with this knowing is at first, like you say, it's like glimpsing it through uh, the trees as you're moving along. And it's just an occasional precious glimpse. But then somehow it happens that... Uh, you know it's there always. And I suspect for me, uh, the thousands of times that I have started my inquiry asking, do I exist, may have uh, helped me see this. That's a wonderful technique. <laughs> If you always get a positive answer, right? Yes, yes, always. And uh, <laughs> I had felt also that this way it starts the inquiry already deeper than the mind and the senses. That's really good. Now, yeah. kind of jumping to the absolute platform without any intermediate steps. Yeah, that's right. You don't need the intermediate step since it's always there to begin with. You don't need to work up to it. Well, you can analyze it logically that, okay, I'm conscious of the world. How am I conscious of the world? Mm -hmm. There has to be preconditions in order to be conscious, one has to be aware. Mm -hmm. And in order to be aware, one has to exist. <laughs> mm -hmm. One has to have being. Yes. And that's different from becoming or transformation. Yes. Where you're changing from one state to another. Yes. Because that means that being and awareness were there before consciousness. Yes. They pre-exist consciousness, and they're there after consciousness. So I was just reading a sutra, a Buddha sutra this morning, and he was talking about how this awareness of silent being, if you really investigate it, huh? I was attracted to the sutra because of the use of the word investigation. Yes. Vichar. Yes. Um, if you really investigate this conditioned consciousness, you find, A, it's not real because it's temporary. Yes. Temporary, unsatisfactory, and not self. Because you're seeing it as a separate thing out, yes. outside and different from yourself. Right. It's an object of perception. Yes, it's duality. Yes. And then when you get down right down to it, you can see that this beingness always exists. There is no way that it could not exist. Yes. And so it's unconditioned being. And yes. he says this, just this is the end of suffering. I like that so much. Yes. Yes. Now, related to this, uh, one of the uh, meditation experiences I had uh, early in the days of practicing is I had been 
introduced, I think, by Nomi to the form of inquiry that is, who knows this instead of who am I? And uh, I was pursuing this line of inquiry and uh, suddenly who am I and who knows this merged into the same inquiry and uh, I saw in that moment that you cannot separate being from knowing and uh, that's just a, a hint along the way of uh, reality, but uh, it was an important understanding for me. Well, yes, I mean, the important thing there is that it was an experience yes. that you came to by your own practice. Yes. Not something you read in a book somewhere. Yes. And as that experience in my own practice, now it is certain, you know, this is rock solid and certain, and it's just how I understand myself and everything. Of course, it's all the same thing. Once you see it, it's obvious. Right. right. How? Yes. Yes. You just have to see it. And the, the, the practice is to get rid of all the distractions that keep us from seeing it. Yes. And the distractions, of course, are very much generated by this ego mind. That's its job, I think, is to distract Absolutely. us. <laughs> we talked in that series on existential ambiguity many years ago about the root sequence of the Putujana. Uh, Putujana means the untrained person, mm -hmm. you know, the ordinary human being without any guidance from a guru. And the, the whole essence of it is that we project, or the mind projects, this thought of I into everything. And this is a different kind of I than the self, I, yes. I. This is the small I, the small S, self, because it's predicated on or conditioned by perception and desire, mm -hmm. name and form. So every time we have a perception, the mind is like a, a machine that just sort of latches onto that perception and injects the concept of I into it, mm -hmm. adding it to the right. uh, actuality of the thing. Well, here you talked about context, and the I takes these sensory experiences and deals with them within this context of this imagined I. Right, but it's a synthetic context. Well, it's not real. That's right, but it's what it's got, you know. It yeah, it is what it is. Does the best it can with the poor information it has, and the reason it's poor information is that all of it is just assumptions and imagination. Well, there are entire lineages of Buddhist teachers, especially the Sayadaw lineage from uh, Thailand, uh, who make this their practice, simply observing this. Mm -hmm. And when you see it, once you see it, it uproots completely the false ego, mm -hmm. cutting the root, in other words. Yes, yes. And it's interesting to me that in so many places, they've come to this same kind of understanding and have developed uh, approaches to be able to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, in many traditions, even yeah. the Native Americans. Yes, yes. Okay, shall Not we? Just, oh, yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, shall we continue? 
Yeah, we have plenty of food for thought, so let's go on to the next course. <laughs> okay, the next course is uh, one of the biggest courses that we will consume, and uh, Ramana was going to talk in this uh, section about the Mahavakyas, and I thought before we go into Ramana's talking about them, it would be worthwhile at least reviewing briefly uh, what they are. And the Mahavakyas are uh, the great teachings that are taken from uh, the Vedas and the Upanishads. And uh, they are, you could look at them like they are the basic teachings of Advaita, of non-duality. And there are just four of them. And the first one is Pranyana Brahma. Consciousness or awareness is Brahman. And I know this is one that I've heard you talk about recently. And you explain this well. For me, it's hard to explain it because it's just obvious. And so it's hard to explain what I just know. Well, that's what another meaning of pragyana is. <laughs> what is obvious or immediately perceived. Yes. So what is obvious or immediately perceived is Brahman. That's pretty clear. Uh, that leads to the next, which is I am Atma Brahma. This self is Brahman. So in case you had any idea that it was external, then this should clear it up. This self is Brahman. Then the third is the most famous of these, Tatvam Asi, Thou Art That. And the fourth is Aham Brahmasmi, I Am Brahman. And it's interesting that uh, the fourth and the third seem like uh, they are saying uh, the same thing, but uh, from different angles. And so, is, what can you tell us about uh, this different points of view of the <laughs> same thing? Well, as I discussed in the recent video, which I'm going to put in a, a link to here, that uh, Aham Brahma Asmi means really, if you translate it literally, I am that I am. Okay. Which, of course, is the famous uh, saying of God to Moses yes. in the Old Testament, when God is speaking from the burning bush. And this is a wonderful symbol, yes. because the bush is burning, but it's not being used up. Yes. So in the same way, consciousness is shining. Brahman is uh, emanating everything that is. Yet, as the Sri Upanishad invocation says, he is now not diminished by this. Purnam eva vashishyate. That even yes. though so many complete and full things like this material world and the living beings appear to emanate from Brahman, Brahman is not in the least diminished in his wholeness yes. and completeness. Yes. So that's that one. And then tat twam asi, tat is a code word for Brahman. Yes. And twam means you, asi is you are. 
So uh, this is uh, the guru speaking to the disciple. Yes. Saying, you are that Brahman. Nothing else. You might think, I'm the guru, so I may be Brahman, but you're not. No, you are Brahman. Yes. So in, other, in order to clear all the doubts, these four Mahavakyas express the same thought from different points of view. Yes. And again, I appreciate it. There are some who can hear any one of these once, and that's enough. And there are some, I would have to say, like this one, that uh, had to hear it many, many times, and finally hearing it wasn't even enough. You somehow have to know it and be it until it counts. I remember so clearly. <laughs> I was looking for Brahman outside myself. Yes. And this was an old habit. One day I was walking down the Parikram path in Tiruvannamalai, and I passed a group of sadhus who were talking among themselves. And suddenly they started to laugh. And I don't know why, that triggered the realization that, oh, actually, I am Brahman. Yes. Why am I looking outside when this is what I am? Yes. And it's funny, so, these yeah. experiences, uh, these deep realizations that seem to happen in circumstances like this, and I have no <laughs> idea of that and what the mind is kind of imprinted by the circumstances and it wants to feel somehow something was significant about the circumstances, but it's not the external circumstances that matter. It's well, it's interesting in that, um, what's that called? The, uh, the Book of Secrets, the uh, Vigyan Tantra. Um, Shiva gives several examples of how one can realize Brahman in ordinary circumstances of life. For example, one that, I, that comes to mind immediately is when viewing something far away. For a moment, the mind is suspended. Mm -hmm. Or watching the thoughts and then watching the gaps between the thoughts. Yes. That's another one. Yes. There are several more that I, I don't remember right in a second. But uh, in other words, we see how the mind is conditional. Yes. It doesn't always exist. Yes. Like consciousness, like awareness, yes. like being. Yes. And, you know, again, I don't know why it is these moments just happen and you're able to break through. Uh, it seems like the defenses of the mind and get to reality. I think it may have something to do with surprise. Okay. There's a nice Zen story about the disciple who comes to see the master. And it happened that the disciple was blind. So he came to see the master and they had some talk. And then during that time, it had become dark outside. So the master gave the disciple a lamp, like a hurricane lantern, you know, a candle mm -hmm. in a, yes. some kind of enclosure, and said, here, take this lamp so others can see you and won't collide with you on the path. Yes. Then just before or just while giving the lamp to the disciple, he blew out the candle. <laughs> And at that moment, the disciple attained. 
Isn't that a wonderful story? Yes, yes. <laughs> now, there are similar stories that I had heard from the Chan background about surprise and one form of them was uh, the disciple had had uh, some meeting with the master and the meeting was over and the disciple was leaving and on his way out and the master would say right now what is it and you know interrupt this person's train of thought and action and uh Again, for some people, that was enough. Or the Zen stick. Yes. You know, the, when it's done right, you don't know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. It's a complete surprise. Yes. Well, back to our uh, text for today. <laughs> We enjoy telling these stories. Yeah, because it illustrates the universality of the teaching. Yes, yes. So verse 505 then starts to talk about the Mahavakyas. And it's interesting to me that uh, in this text, Ramana talks about only one of the four Mahavakyas maybe since they all say the same thing that is appropriate but Ramana when he talks about the one even narrows it down more finely than that one so here let's get to uh, what is said churned out of the many sayings that remove ignorance which are contained in the four Vedas the one essential phrase denoting the absolute truth, silence, is, quote, the oneness of the individual soul and the supreme, Jima, Jiva, Brahma, Akaya, the Mahavakya, thou art, that thou art, Tatvam Asi, also denotes this. So he focuses on the one Mahavakya. And one of the things I love about this particular verse is how his word, use of the word silence. Silence to him is a synonym for Brahman. Yes, yes. Because yeah. Brahman is without boundaries, without categories, and without any limits. There's nothing to say. Yes. There isn't another thing to talk about. And as soon as you start to talk, you express limits. That's what words do. Words break up the uh, undivided universe into separate little pieces so you can manipulate them. So even the first word then starts to try to break up this infinite reality into pieces. And the first word is I. Of course. What other word is there? <laughs> That's the word we love the most. So let's go on with his exposition here because he gets more direct in terms of practice. Here, Sadhu Om says... I think um, you, you skipped one. I did skip one. You did. Okay. This is what I wanted to see. Then uh, Ramana says, For the highly mature souls who seek the supreme sat ananda in order to free themselves from the scorching heat of birth and death, it is by the inquiry into only the word thou, which out of the three words, that, thou, and art, denotes the nature of the individual soul and the glory of liberation, 
is attained. And Sadhu Om goes on to say, we should remember here Sri Bhagavan's instruction in verse 32 of Uladu Napadu as to what an earnest and sincere disciple should do when he hears the Mahavakya that thou art from a guru. As soon as he hears the phrase that thou art, the disciple's attention should turn to know what am I? This is the real aim with which the Mahavakya was revealed. The one important word that stands in the above Mahavakya to turn the disciple's mind to self-attention is thou. Therefore, this verse categorically asserts that out of the three words, thou alone should be taken for scrutiny by a worthy disciple. The following two verses emphasize the same idea. And this You show- already touched on this. Yes, and this shows the almost laser-like focus of Ramana's instruction upon inquiry, that what matters is to get to the root of this idea of thou. And so don't look at the world, don't look at these other things, Uh, investigate yourself and all the ideas that you carry about the self and start to see what is real. And of course, what is real is what is always. And the other things that come and go, like my opinion of myself (laughs) as the small self, uh, that's not real. That's just uh, a fantasy like last night's dream. Remember, well, there's a nice story yes. um, that if you have a scale, a balance, and you put this Mahavakya cut from Masi on one side, and then you put all the scriptures on the other side, this Mahavakya is still heavier. It's so heavy with meaning. Yes. And really, that's what guru means. Guru means heavy. Okay, I didn't know. Lagu la, la means light. Guru means heavy. Okay. One of the meanings. Okay. So, so. the guru is one who has realized Tatramasi or Aham Brahmasmi. And then he gives this to the disciple as Tatram. You are that. So then the disciple should say, Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And look into it. Yes. Guru is not going to say this arbitrarily. Yes. There's a good reason for it. And the reason is to spark that Atma Vichara, looking into the self, investigating more. And, you know, that word investigation, it's like a detective. A detective uh, looks at a crime scene, let's say, and searches for evidence. That means clues that lead to a certain uh, mm-hmm. suspect or, uh, you know, different outcome, like uh, making a conviction or whatever. So investigation means we're looking for clues that this saying is correct. Not that we're doubting it and trying to disprove it or something, huh? but like the balance, we have Tatuamasi on one side, and then we have all of these other impressions and thoughts and experiences on the other. And we have to see how they don't outweigh the truth. 
Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing about investigation is that if you're serious about investigation, then for that moment, you have to kind of suspend your belief in what you think you know is true. And I think uh, that is a vital part of it. There's a Korean Zen teacher who was Song Song, which I'm sure I mispronounce. And uh, when asked, what is practice? He said, don't know. Very good answer. Yes, so investigate. What he was is what he was saying, and I love it when you have these different sources that are all pointing in the same way. Yes, although they use different language, yes, and sometimes that's a source of confusion. Yes, but of if course. you look through the language to the meaning, the essence is really the same. Yes. It confused me for a while to realize that uh, the Buddhist saying of no self and the Advaita saying all self, that those both mean the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's apparently opposite. Right. But this is an area of paradox. Yes. So it's not uh, surprising, really, that two opposite seeming statements could mean the same. Yes. You just have to look at the reality behind the statements. And Uh just all you have to do is experience what they're talking about. Then everything is clear. Right. Yes. Let's go on to some more verses for more clarity. Excuse me, I skipped forward. Now... Only in order to turn inward the minds of less mature aspirants, which will be favorable for the aforesaid inquiry, the Vedas added the other two words, that, tat, and art, asi, to the word thou, tsvam, thereby guru vachakai kolai, forming the Mahavakya, thou art that. Thus you should know. And let me go to the next verse. I think this is the key to what he is saying. Verily, the inquiry done within oneself to know the real import denoted by the word thou. What is it? Who am I is the proper means to know the correct import of the other two words also. Well, who denotes a being, a person, a a conscious entity. And am denotes something that exists, that is real. Although we misuse the word uh, being, to be, or am, uh, often to refer to abstractions or imaginary things like I, Mm -hmm. (laughs) still, here, it refers to those things that have actual being. Yes. That never change. Yes. So who is a sentient being? Who am? And I, of course, refers to the self. And this gives us, if you look deeply into it, several different paths that you can take in your investigation. And uh, one of my favorite is the am path. You know, what am? There is something 
Uh, this is another thing that as I've looked to see that I exist, there's something there every time I look. And so it's obvious that something am, but uh, just what is it? And uh. Uh, in looking for what is it, it becomes obvious after a while that it is uh, this substratum or something. Again, there aren't words for it. There's all of this stuff that comes and go and changes and tries to fascinate you like the shiny lure going through the water attracting the fish to strike out and uh, take it. But none of that is real. What has to be, again, when I started to investigate, uh, one of the ideas that I found in this investigation is, I don't know who I am. I don't know what all of this is. But uh, it can't be all of that stuff that is changing because I'm there through all of those changes, I am there. So it can't be that stuff that is changing. What is it that is there always? Well, we can see this even in our ordinary experience in a single day. Yes. You know, if we think the body is the self, then when we're dreaming, this body doesn't exist. Yes. Or the world or the senses. Yes. But there's another body, a dream body. Yes. And it all operates by different rules. Yes. Crazy things can happen in dreams. And then we go into deep sleep, and even the mind ceases to exist. There are no thoughts. There's nothing to be aware of. So we can question whether we're existing or not. But the fact is, we are perceiving that we are not perceptive. Yes. Or percipient, I think yes. is the proper word. Um, so there is something that is always aware, even in deep sleep. Yes. This is not easy to see, but if you're really, like you say, if you're really serious about investigation, you'll look into it or at least reason about it. Right. So the only thing that could be the real self is that silent sense of being. Yes. And that always on awareness that never changes. Yes. Like a mirror. Yes. Sometimes no. it has objects and sometimes it doesn't. Right. But it doesn't change uh, the consciousness, whether it has things to be aware of objectively or not. The consciousness is there. Now, Nomi, uh, one of the things he would do to help us is uh, ask us, uh, in dreams, you have this sense of reality in the dream where does this sense of reality come from? Oh, that's a good one. And if you look into it, you have to think, oh, this has to be a projection. Because I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not looking out through the senses. Yes. Huh? yes. Where is the dream happening? Yes. It has to be in my mind. Yes. It's certainly not out there in the world. Yes, but I feel the dream is real. And is this reality from the dream or is it from me? I feel the dream is real because I am real. And yeah. so that's where it comes from. Just like Ramana says, uh, watch thoughts. Where are they coming from? Yes. If you investigate deeply enough, you'll find the self. Yes. 
And that's what he wanted us to do in these verses, is to investigate deeply enough. And what are you going to find when you do that? We don't want to give you any hints. Find it oh, yourself. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if we do, even if we lay out everything for you, you still have to find it yourself. Yes. And this is one of the flaws of Neo Adreta, is that people hear these statements and they learn them and use them and they think that is self realization. Okay. But they haven't done the work, mm -hmm. they haven't actually realized it. And yes. of course, someone who is good at playing a role can deceive others into thinking that they are self realized. Yes. But uh, Ramana doesn't approve of that. From the very beginning, he always says, you have to do the work. Yes. He only gives a guide. He gives a direction, like a map, like a compass. Yes. Go this way. Follow this path, and you will reach the cell. But you have to do the, the reaching. <laughs> yes. You have to do the, the char, the investigation. Yes, and now the role of the loving the guru is that it helps when the guru gives you this kind of instruction uh, that for you to believe what he says and take it as reality and then it helps your motivation to actually do the work. The thing is, though, the, the kind of belief that the guru is asking for here is not the kind of belief or faith that, for example, a, a sectarian religion yes. demands. They, they want you to be satisfied with the words alone. Yes. But Ramana is more like a teacher of physics or chemistry who who writes a formula up on the board and then says, okay, now go into the lab. Right, yes. And investigate it. And our Experiment lab is, with it. Our lab is sitting quietly under a tree. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has the, all the necessary equipment to verify these assertions. Yes. These theories or um, yeah, empirical observations of the realized soul. Yes. And when it starts, uh, you do the investigation in some set time or place, like I have my 20 minutes to meditate and that's when I do it. But uh, that is just the beginning phase there you know who I am is always so I don't need to notice that in some special time or place instead of uh, doing it when I meditate or in addition to doing it when I meditate I can do it when I'm standing in line at the supermarket and it's it turns because the the self never changes. Yes. The same situation is there in all circumstances. Yes. And so when you start to do this, then it's like your life becomes your practice. Yeah, it should become an attitude. Yes. That's with you always. Yes. Just like bhakti. Bhakti may start as uh, ceremonies, making offerings, or contemplation of the form of God, or something like that. But over time, it becomes an attitude, an attitude of love. And because God is everything, one should have a loving attitude 24 hours a day in any circumstance. And that is the perfection of bhakti, which leads naturally to meditation. So all these things 
naturally occurs or spontaneously arise in someone who is following the path at whatever level. Yes. And if the person following the path is fortunate, then they will find someone who can point them past the next bend in the path to what is ahead. Yes, and the path has several bends. <laughs> yes, yes. And I am deeply grateful for those who are with us pointing the way. Yeah, it's a blessing to be yes. in association yes. with those who are willing to give this information. And even though we have to repeat ourselves again and again, yes, um, it's a great source of punya. Yes. And everyone who is serious about this path should share whatever they know. Yes. You don't have to be like a super self-realized guru. Just share what you know. Yes. Because there's somebody out there who needs to hear it. Yes. And needs, even if you just like share these videos on social media or yes. something like that. You know, hearing it from some other uh, it's one of the things that just provides encouragement. Besides encouragement, sometimes it provides precious guidance. You know, he says, right. hey, around that corner, there is something really great. Yeah, like Shiva in the uh, uh, Kulan, uh, Kulanjana Tantra that we were just looking at. He says, one comes to this highest stage by recitation of mantras, even in other lineages even with a sense of duality between the self and the object. Doesn't matter. But by doing any facet of religion, one gradually advances until one becomes qualified to know the highest truth. Yes, yes. Now I've so heard it, that. It is not to be discouraged. Yes. I've heard it said in another way, which says uh, any amount of practice is uh, beneficial and none of it is wasted. But some is more powerful than others. Yes. Well, that's the advantage of having that guy ahead of you on the road pointing the way. <laughs> well, uh I think this is going to be our last time for this year. We'll take a break next week and resume then in a couple of weeks. And see you, I'll see you next year. I'll see you next year. <laughs> and what I want to do is continue to look at this particular chapter on practice and see what other pointings we can get down the road from that highest of masters, Ramana. I'm sure that any attention that we give to Guru Vachaka Kolai is uh, well spent. Yes, yes. So, very good. Namaste, Richard. Namaste. That's um, And Om... Namo Ramanaya. Oh. Um. Um.